Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the 15th biennial Ralph H. and Ruth F. Gross Lecture and Reception. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Edward Abraham, Executive Vice President for Health Affairs and Chief Executive Officer of the University of Miami Health System. Dr. Abraham came to Miami in 2017 as Dean and Chief Academic Officer of the Miller School of Medicine and now is responsible for the strategic and operational leadership of the health system. Dr. Abraham, who joined the University of Miami after serving as Dean of the Wake Forest School of Medicine, is an internationally renowned pulmonary medicine and critical care physician and an accomplished scientist. He has received many honors, including the Recognition Award for Scientific Accomplishments from the American Thoracic Society, and has served as an editor and editorial board member of several top medical journals. Dr. Abraham is leading the transformation and expansion of U Health, the only university-based medical system in South Florida. And he is working with all of us through our unsurpassed patient care, education, and discovery to become a transformational leader in defining the future of medicine. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Edward, Edward Abraham this afternoon. Thanks, Joanne. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is really, I'm really very excited to introduce this lecture, which is titled Renaissance, but it's really, as the dean knows, Excelsior, more than anything else, on to the next level. Um, I'd like to welcome two special guests uh, before we start, Carol Gross Clarkson and Patricia Gross Bergman, who are Ruth and Ralph Gross's daughters. Great to see you. We met before. It's really a privilege to honor your parents' memories with this ongoing lecture series. I'd like to thank uh, the staff of the Lois Calder Library uh, for hosting this fantastic event as well. I'd also like to recognize our institutional leadership from both the Miller School and U Health and the university, our faculty and our staff who are all here today. The Ralph H. and Ruth F. Gross Lecture Series is a unique opportunity for us to highlight exceptional speakers who address the value of health information. This is really at the heart of how this lecture series came to be. A little bit of history uh, and background. So Ruth and Ralph Gross came to Broward County before World War II and purchased a poultry farm. The business had an inauspicious start. Only eight of the first group of chickens survived. Ralph was determined to know why those eight survivors made it. So that's really evidence of scientific interest. What was the mechanism for survival in those chickens? So he spent hour after hour in the Lewis Calder Memorial Library researching nutrition and consulting with UM faculty members. What he learned helped him to invent feed supplements that built immunity in warm-blooded animals from infectious diseases. And then later, he patented this nutritional aid. After he passed away, his wife Ruth created an endowment to support the library and to fund this lecture series, which occurs every other year. We're incredibly grateful for that support and your family's involvement and your involvement with the lecture series in our institution. Our lecture today is truly committed to making sure our students have the most optimal learning experience. It's been deeply involved in renovating, rejuvenating, innovating with our medical school curriculum. Dr. Henri R. Ford is the Dean and Chief Academic Officer at the Miller School. He's a renowned pediatric surgeon, 
He received his bachelor's degree from Princeton, his MD degree from Harvard Medical School. Dean Ford also received his MHA degree from the School of Policy, Planning, and Development at the University of Southern California. Dean Ford has achieved unprecedented success throughout his career. He's conducted groundbreaking research on the pathogenesis of necrotizing enterocolitis, the most common and lethal disease affecting the gastrointestinal tract of newborn infants. Dr. Ford is the author of more than 300 publications, book chapters, invited manuscripts, abstracts, editorials, and presentations. Relevant to today, as I mentioned, he's been leading the effort to make sure that the Miller School is one of our nation's preeminent medical schools, setting new levels of excellence for the School of Medicine. It's really part of our mission to become a true international destination across all of our missions, clinical care, research, and education, and he's participated in all of these. It's been a wonderful uh, experience for me to have him as a partner since he's been here, and I'm very excited to have him as a lecturer today for this event. So please join me in welcoming the Dean. Well, thank you so much, Ed, for this very kind and generous introduction. It is a distinct privilege for me to give this uh, gross lecture, especially in front of uh, you, and we thank you for your support, we thank you for the generosity, and we thank you for the legacy that continues to live, and we hope to make you proud. Um, what I thought I would do this afternoon is share with you the path uh, for the Miller School of Medicine, and we could easily have uh, titled it the path to uh, preeminence, but uh, we will focus on renaissance, the future of the Miller School of Medicine. But as I began to reflect on and work on the, the, this, this talk, it became abundantly clear that one hour was simply not going to be enough. So, so we're gonna have to therefore truncate uh, uh, the focus and, and predominantly talk a little bit about uh, the reform that we are undertaking in medical education, uh, spearheaded uh, by none other than uh, Dr. Machaber uh, and his colleague, Amar Deshpande. And so in fact, we call it uh, the Machaber curriculum, for those of you who don't know. Uh, so here are the objectives, because I need good talk, uh, which could not fail, could, could, should not fail to present the objectives, otherwise our medical students ask, ask for a tuition rebate. Because uh, they have to know what to concentrate and what's going to be on the test. Well, there won't be any tests. Uh, but what we're going to try to do, though, especially for the skeptics, for those of you, um, I'm sure there is no skeptic in the audience, but uh, individuals who would question why we would need to undergo a curricular renewal, I hope that uh, you'll, come across, you'll come away convinced that it is a good thing. It is part of our job in terms of supplying the, the health, supplying the health system with the right types of individuals uh, to carry out uh, uh, its mission. So we will talk about the uh, impetus uh, for innovation in medical education. We will summarize the approach to developing transformative medical education in particular. Uh, we will discuss the Machaber curriculum as a model for transformational leaders. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, approach to strategic support uh, for research at the Miller School of Medicine, because after all, it's research and education, although we are going to focus primarily on education this afternoon. Um, so this is a quick review of uh, the Miller School, past and present. Uh, we know it's the oldest school in the state of Florida. Uh, this is where uh, Harvey found, was, was uh, born. Uh, that's the cardiopulmonary simulator that uh, has been widely adopted pretty much across uh, uh, the country and the world as far as uh, the training uh, uh, students uh, in simulation. Uh, although initially it was mostly to teach people how to do a, a proper uh, cardiovascular exam. Middle school has also been associated with seminal contributions in the field of cellular therapeutics, 
We remain at the forefront of advances in clinical care, medical education, and translational medicine. We have some of the outstanding pro clinical programs in the world right here, and we are sitting uh, in the auditorium of the number one uh, eye hospital in the world for 16 consecutive years, Baskin Palmer. Uh, we also have brilliant uh, programs that have been designated or recognized by your Estimates and World Report, ENT, Dermatology, and you name the surgery, to name a few. And of course, we all recently celebrated uh, the designation, the NCI designation for Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. So there's no question that uh, great things are happening here. There's no question in my mind that there is enormous potential, enormous potential for both the middle school and youth health to become truly one of the leading academic health centers in the nation. And MSOM, I believe, and I believe it seriously, is poised to become one of the top 15 medical schools in the, in the near future. We can define how near is near, but there is no question that this is the road for the middle school. So how do we achieve this bold vision? How do we get there? Well, there's no question, as you've heard me say time and time again, we must promote a culture of excellence across every discipline while striving for selective preeminence, as well articulated by our own president, Julio Frank. We must optimize the learning environment for all learners, and as you know, I'm the learner in chief. So everybody here is a learner, so in that way, we all must be uh, properly incentivized, properly supported to uh, practice our craft to the fullest. We must create a new vision for the future of medical education at the middle school, because if we are not innovating, we are stagnating. So why a new vision? Well, clearly changes in healthcare delivery require our future doctors to become transformational leaders who will effectively direct health systems um, to actually promote more value-based healthcare delivery, use implementation science to achieve improvements in health systems, as well as champion discovery and its translation into clinical interventions. And all of this is to improve the health outcomes for our patients, both locally, nationally, and globally. Let's look a little bit about the evolution of, me of um, medical education reform over time. So before 1900, the brief Flexner uh, era, it was medical education or medical training in general was more of an apprenticeship. Basically, you follow someone and eventually you became a doctor. But then the revolutionary report from Flexner in 1910 completely changed everything. It really incorporated uh, the uh, foundations of, um, well, it, it introduced the basic sciences into the medical curriculum in a more formal manner, uh, which is where we developed the two plus two articulation, two years of basic sciences, followed by two years of um, clinical care of, of clerkship, two years of clinical work, and then you become a doctor. In, 19, in the 1960s, uh, originating from McMaster, Hospital, um, McMaster University in Canada, we saw the introduction of uh, you know, problem-based learning in an attempt uh, to further diversify our approach. This is almost a little bit of a throwback to the preflexnarian era. So out of that, we can say there are three um, ways of classifying the innovations in medical education over time. Um, and this is really taken from some of the work by Julio Frank. So if we look at what happened, the contribution from the pre-Flexnerian area where it was more of an apprenticeship to Flexner's uh, you know, seminal contributions, it really became an informative, it became an infor type of informative learning where you were acquiring knowledge and skills. And the objective here was to produce experts, people who were fully grounded in the basic sciences of medicine. And then from there, with the introduction of PBL, we moved to formative learning, which is more about socializing students around values. And here, we are trying to produce professionals. And more recently, 10 years ago, at, uh, as the, for the anniversary of the Flexner Report, President Frank and a group of uh, scholars uh, commissioned by the Lancet um, um, Journal uh, came up with the concept of transformative learning. And transformative learning is really about developing leadership attributes to produce enlightened change agents, people who are going to really lead health system, people who are really going to be uh, change makers. So 
transformative learning. So why do we why do we need transformative learning, and why should we care about this approach? The rationale is simple. What we see is an evolving interdependence in health, partly driven by limited resources, uh, also the limited uh, number of skilled workers. Now, if you start thinking globally, seven and a half billion people in the world, there are five billion who have inadequate access uh, to proper uh, surgical care, anesthesia care, and so on and so forth. So you can begin to imagine that uh, indeed uh, this is a serious problem. Opportunities for mutual learning and shared progress are expanding. Flows across national borders are accelerating. And with the global movement of people, technologies, and form information, and, and the transfer of knowledge, we also have the transfer of pathogens, okay? infectious pathogens, environmental pathogens, all of which really present significant health risks to, the, to citizens globally. So there is also increasing emphasis, as we hear it always uh, from uh, the health system side, on stewardship of resources. We just don't have unlimited access to resources. We want to focus on patient outcomes. We have to do better with chronic disease management and change delivery and, change, and the changing delivery of uh, care models, uh, which are uh, and payment models, uh, which are placing additional demands on health workers. We hear all the time that uh, there is not enough time to complete the chart. We have too many. Uh, we have to make sure we generate the right number of RVUs. We have to complete everything in a timely fashion. Make sure that the document documentation is complete. So all of these really are placing additional stressors on the care providers. And last but not least, there is a gap between the physician training and the future needs of our healthcare system because the need because this is. The way we train individuals now is clearly not the way the health systems are evolving and the way they're going to be practicing tomorrow. So consequently, our new physicians entering medicine must lead the way to improve care delivery systems and lead to healthier populations. So let's talk a little bit about transformative learning and what it entails. Essentially, it's a shift from three things. It's to shift from fact memorization to critical reasoning. Uh, so it's about equipping the students with the ability to search, analyze, assess, or process uh, information uh, for better decision making. It's to shift from seeking professional credentials to achieving core competencies, again, so that they can function more effectively within the context of a team. And last but not least, it's a shift from non-critical adoption of educational models, uh, this is just a passive adaptation of whatever they tell you, to more creative adaptation of global resources to address local priorities. So it's really shaping their, their, their creative uh, thought, but also their ability to expand um, on, on, on information and interpret this information, even taken from a different context, into, to help solve local problems. One of the requirements for transformative learning is interdependence because it underscores the ways in which components interact with each other without presupposing that they're equal. So interdependence, uh, which means we have to be able to deal with our nursing colleagues, our pharmacists, our allied health professionals, and um, really as far as a care delivery team. It's no longer the situation where one individual, the physician, is calling all the shots, but we really, uh, it's really the time for interprofessional education, where clinicians, non-clinicians, and learners uh, share responsibilities so that all team members operating at the top of their license can contribute to the health of the patients. That's really the process that's going to be uh, most effective in terms of uh, producing transformational leaders who are going to be eff effectively able to um, influence the health systems. So interdependence in education really involves three shifts. It's from isolated to harmonized education and health systems, from standalone institutions to worldwide networks, alliances, and consortia, and from self-generated and self-controlled institutional assets to harnessing global flows of educational content, pedagogical resources, as well as innovations. So transformative learning and interdependence in education really require both instructional as well as institutional reforms. We have embarked already on some of, on, on some of those components, actually on both components, right? Uh, so we, 
we believe that uh, transformative learning is the proposed outcome of instructional reform, which is really why we're embarking on the next gen MD curriculum, while interdependence, interdependence in education should result from institutional reform. So that's really about the culture change. And we are undergoing that process as well. And we'll get back to it. So for instructional reform, we need to adopt competency-driven approaches to instructional design. So that's these milestones or entrustable professional activities. And we need to adapt these, comp these competencies to rapidly changing conditions on global resources. And we need to promote interprofessional as well as transprofessional education that breaks down silos while enhancing collaborative and non-hierarchical relationships in effective teams. That is really essential for the functioning of a great health system. We need to exploit the power of information technology for learning. We need to strengthen educational resources for faculty development, for training in new competency areas. If we're going to teach them, if we're going to require a new approach, our faculty must be trained to deliver this new curriculum. And we need to use competencies as objective criteria for classification of health professionals and develop a common set of values around social accountability. So, what should institutional reform consist of? Well, institutional reform should clearly establish joint education and health planning uh, mechanisms that take into account all the cultural dimensions of the participants. This, is, this includes social uh, origin, age distribution, gender, as well as uh, uh, other you know, unknown criteria for us, uh, unknown characteristics of the of the health workforce, but so basically we need to be sensitive to a number of different attributes. We need to expand academic health centers to become truly academic health systems, encompassing networks of hospitals and primary care units. And last but not least, we need to link together through global networks, alliances and consortia, and nurture a culture of critical in inquiry. But we know that there are many barriers to transformative learning. It's not going to be widely accepted. And some of those barriers uh, we've been confronting already, it's cultural resistance or institutional rigidity, lack of funding to support innovative reform, creating some skepticism even among the participants, among the, among the champions of uh, this type of transformative, learning, of transformative learning. The lack of strong stewardship, real or perceived accreditation and regulatory restrictions, underdeveloped technology, Historical divide between the healthcare system and academic system leaders. Thank God that doesn't exist here. Oh, that's all? Okay. Uh, thank you. And of course, we lack evaluative metrics to assess effectiveness. But the benefits are tremendous. We now can, if we adopt this concept, we will be able to train physicians or students in the science of healthcare delivery and also in their role within the health system. And that's a very, very important, that's a very important contribution if we are going to have an optimal healthcare delivery system. We'll be able to address healthcare finances and how to be responsible uh, and, how, and teach them how to be responsible stewards of healthcare costs by teaching them the business of medicine, yet another key component of, uh, of this uh, new curriculum. We need to be able to, we will be able to prepare physicians to effectively lead teams of healthcare professionals and promote health system innovations. And we'll be able to support flexible pathways for physician training and assess competencies, uh, competencies that students need to acquire before and during medical school, as well as their readiness to enter surgical residency. We believe that transformative medical education will lead to more equitable and better performing health systems than we currently have. And the consequent benefits will be for our patients, all the populations everywhere in the world. And in this process, our goal, our overarching goal, is all, has always been to optimize health outcomes for patients, families, and communities. And this is how we're going to equip the new learners to, be even, to deliver on this promise even more effectively. So let's transition to see how we have been adopting these particular principles to frame the new curriculum at the Middle School of Medicine, the next Gen MD slash Machado. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll, we'll ease up on you. 
Um, so, so this is a slide that shows the evolution of the MD curriculum at the, the Miller School, uh, starting really in the early years uh, from the birth of this uh, great uh, medical school uh, to almost 2017 when uh, the impetus for change uh, was recognized, we can see that uh, we have not made uh, many significant changes over time. Um, so somewhere around 2017, in the faculty, uh, when we were preparing for the LCME site visit, uh, did the self-study and said, you know what, uh, maybe it's time for us uh, to start looking at the, at the approach uh, to medical education and then uh, begin to maybe shake things up a little bit. Um, a task force was uh, created, uh, 25 faculty members, uh, and they went to work after consulting with a number of other institutions that also were undergoing or entertaining curricular reform, uh, and they decided uh, to do something absolutely novel and completely different at the middle school. Uh, this comes in, Dr. Deshpande, Dr. Machaber, uh, um, uh, under the guidance of uh, the interim dean at the time, the great Dr. Lanny Gardner. So, um, when I arrived, it was clear that uh, there had been a lot of thoughts uh, put into this process. Uh, but the question that I posed was, so what is the profile of the middle school graduate? What is it that we want to produce? And, and this is really where we had to pause for a second because it, it's one thing to embark on change, but it's a lot better if you know what the destination is. If you're going to change your curriculum, you have to have something in mind. And you have to really have the end in mind in order to really design it appropriately so you can achieve that purported goal. And, and so consequently, we stepped back a little bit and, and came together in a visioning exercise, um, bringing that featured all the thought leaders uh, and, and key stakeholders um, in medical education at the middle school. And we started by asking the question, why do we exist? What is our purpose? What is our raison d'etre? Very much taking a page, borrowing a page from Simon Sinek's uh, work, always start with why. And the, the group came, came up with this really very powerful uh, model. They say, we exist to empower the learners to transform lives. This is the middle school, that is. Exists to empower our learners to transform lives and to inspire them to serve our global community. So, so that's really what we have to do in delivering this, core, in this, this new curriculum. And ultimately, the goal is to actually create transformational leaders, as we stated before, who are going to be able to help shape the future of medicine, really champion discovery and its translation into clinical interventions, and that will improve health globally. So you had to go from the, we recognize that the care delivery models now is, um, is, is shifting from the old model where you had the single, single physician uh, who was uh, giving care in the context of a clinic or a hospital setting uh, to a new model where we're going to have individuals who are more involved in chronic care delivery, where teamwork becomes critical, and population health uh, becomes absolutely um, a, a critical factor. Um, so 21st century physicians, this is what they're going to be focusing on. We've already touched on some of these. It's going to be a focus on patient and, and, and on population outcomes. They'll be able, they need to be able to engage with other professionals uh, in a model of collaborative practice, hence the concept of intraprofessional education. Uh, they need to be able to use diverse data sets to drive patient care and, and system improvement, uh, collaborate with other macro systems, and of course, um, be able to work effectively with biomedical scientists to help generate new knowledge um, that will be translated uh, into clinical interventions. Well, we believe that uh, at the University of Miami, we have a number of outstanding schools and programs and it is truly to the convergence of the excellence that exists in all these various programs that we can put together a new curriculum that really would be absolute, that would be completely unique um, to this institution and be able to lead to the production of uh, transformational leaders as described earlier. 
Um, so by converging with uh, uh, the law school, the docs program, the Jack Jackson Health System, the business school, nursing school, and so forth, all of which are really outstanding, then we can really design not only programs that emphasize interprofessional education, but also prepare our students with the tools, uh, equip them with the skills necessary to go out there and really uh, become effective uh, uh, change agents. To get there, we have to select the right students. Not that we have not been selecting the right students all along. I mean, when I look at Dr. Tooks in the audience, I know we did something right. Um, but we are going to expand on that, right? So these are some of the qualities uh, that uh, we have historically looked at, uh, but we're also emphasizing the sense of curiosity, creativity. We're looking for leaders. We're looking for individuals who are going to be able to completely uh, uh, challenge the status quo and not simply accept the dogma, the old dogma, right? So it's no longer about passive learning. We really want change agents. Um, we are changing the screening process. We actually, the, the medical school admissions committee is already changing the screening uh, process to place greater, em to place greater emphasis uh, not just on MCAT scores and GPAs and so forth, but also on life experiences, research background, some, some diff something different in that individual's background that would really prepare that uh, student to not only benefit from what this institution has to offer, but also would be able to contribute to our goal to produce um, leaders. Uh, another one that's very key for us is the ability for these individuals to overcome adversity, the grit factor. And the changes, uh, also there have been some changes to the selection process. We no longer have a single interview. Now there are multiple interviews that are being conducted, uh, some even by our senior uh, faculty and department chairs. Um, and, and we're looking at a number of different uh, and very important characteristics. Again, thinking about what the health system is going to need um, for the future. A brief overview of the various phases of the curriculum. I mean, this is, I'm not going to do it as much justice as Dr. Despande and Machabu do, but we're just going to give you a very, very brief overview of uh, some of the key elements. So it's going to be divided into three phases. At least the proposed new curriculum uh, would be divided into three phases. Now, phase one would really focus on delivering the fundamentals of medical sciences. Um, this is using primarily a symptom-based uh, uh, approach. In phase two, we are accelerating introduction to the clerkship uh, year instead of the third year that would be how it happened you know, in year two. And then in phase three, they would return to the classroom to take more advanced, integrated uh, um, science courses and very clinical courses, and also um, and continue to work on a scholarly, pursue a scholarly concentration, almost like a major, um, or perhaps uh, entertain the possibility of going for a dual degree, whether it's a master's in education, communication, uh, in climate change and health, uh, as well as the typical business, uh, engineering, um, or MHA, and so forth. And for a select group of students, we are proposing the opportunity for early transition to residency if they meet a certain uh, entrustable professional activities. And at the same time, they are always going to be exposed to the concept of medicine as a profession, which I call the essentials of medical practice. And really, they emphasize those seven, those, uh, seven different uh, elements. Clinical skills, professionalism, communication skills. These are all elements that will be delivered fairly early on. We're going to work on those from the time they arrive. But uh, the concept of population health would also be introduced uh, fairly early as we try to teach them about the social determinants of health. And, and throughout the entire uh, continuum, uh, they'll be exposed to health system science, nutrition and wellness, as well as uh, focus on personal development. Uh, here's a schematic illustration of what that uh, uh, pre clerkship year looks like, uh, or as some people say, the pre cynical years, uh, because they come in, yeah, glad somebody's awake. Uh, uh, so, so they come in fairly excited and, um, you know, they just are ready to just cure all illness and save humanity. Uh, so we're going to build on that uh, during the first two weeks. 
And this is where we're going to inspire and empower them. They're going to learn communication skills and really introduce them to the concept of doctoring, okay? And then social determinants of health or some of the other elements we've talked about. And then uh, phase 1B, uh, which will last, this lasts two weeks, and it will culminate, by the way, with uh, uh, the donning of the white coat. Um, and then phase 2B is where they're going to be um, learning uh, the fundamentals of medical science, again, using the well patient as a model, but it's going to be uh, a case-based approach. And then phase 1C uh, corresponds to teaching them the pathophysiology, the way we all know it, uh, but we're essentially looking at human disease uh, through a symptom-based approach. And throughout the entire year, they're going to be learning about medicine as a profession, the fundamentals of medical, the essentials of medical practice, as we talked about in the previous slide. Um, the, the concept of a scholarly concentration is going to be introduced again within the first year. And we're going to do that by first by equipping them with the um, tools necessary to start evaluating data in a more critical, uh, in a more critical manner, so that they can actually read the journal uh, and say, "Yeah, this the statistics don't work here. Uh, the premise was really false, and, and it's, so it's it's good. No, it's not good." And there's going to be early introduction to the clinical experience, uh, which is going to be carried out um, pretty much uh, over the entire uh, you know, continuum. Um, and, and we have an EMT light program uh, so that they'll be ready to actually save somebody's life even early if, if they should be at a restaurant and someone is choking. Isn't that terrible if you're in med school and someone is dying with you next to you and you can't do anything? Well, we're going to solve that problem. <laughs> so uh, the clerkship experience is, is straightforward. Okay, so now we are dividing it into four phases. Okay, the practice of med, these are four essentially 12-week uh, um, um, you know, course, uh, courses. So practice of medicine, which features all of these. Uh, then you have the from ER to oral, which includes emergency medicine, anesthesia, uh, then mind, matter, and medicine. And you see the clerkships that are going to be included in that. And then health through lifespan, featuring primarily OB and, uh, and pediatrics. And we're going to continue to emphasize the basic sciences throughout uh, this period. Uh, so this is not, you know, we, this is not uh, basic science light. It's really going to be fairly, it's going to be an integral component of these lectures that they're going to be uh, getting throughout uh, their clerkship experience. And the longitudinal courses will be maintained, uh, especially since we remember the goal is to produce transformational leaders. So the concept of physician, physician as a leader is going to be dealt with pretty much consistently throughout the social determinants of health, and scholarly projects, and so forth. Well, scholarly projects, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of time to deal with that. We recognize that during uh, the uh, clerkship experience. But at the same time, they may remain engaged uh, depending on what's happening in the, with their research mentor. And of course, they're going to continue to pursue health system science and all the other bullets that you see here. So, so the highlights of phase three are, are right there. So it's about career development. This is where we start talking about uh, almost like a, a, akin to a major. Uh, so you can have an area of concentration of ex or expertise. They'll be coming back to take advanced both clinical and basic science electives. Again, uh, even in the clinical sci um, electives, they'll be integrated um, basic science because we can actually now go into greater depth about understanding why someone actually gets uh, on arrhythmia and why the heart depolarizes too early and, and other things that I'm just not qualified to even talk about. Um, but, but, but you really have a number of opportunities to concentrate in various modules that are still being designed, whether it's going to be neuroscience, regenerative medicine, um, and, and so forth. And of course, this is when you have to start uh, focusing on the scholarly project. If you uh, if you're going to be part of that um, um, cycle, you will also be able to, um, you'll be prepared for the effective transition into residency. So a few things that are required as part of this uh, third year, the, the, the free, oh, not third year, but the phase three, uh, you have to produce a scholarly um, project. 
Um, you may also decide to pursue a dual degree um, program, as uh, we've talked about before, or if you really meet the qualifications, then you can actually, uh, in conjunction with our hospitals, we can uh, work out an accelerated pathway to residency. Now, um, again, that would be, uh, that would depend on your ability to meet uh, uh, certain expectations in terms of assessment and entrustment. Yeah. The focus on assessment is, is shifting, um, and to quote Dr. Machaber, whereas we used to emphasize assessment of learning, now we are really shifting to the assessment for learning using low-dose, high-frequency, formative um, um, you know, assessment. And, and, and that's really a radical departure because we want people to master the material and be able to apply it. And, and so forth, we're going to implement uh, the entrustable professional activities, and that's really going to be a key way of evaluating uh, the person's progress as opposed to just giving a numerical grade, which really says not much because it just says, yeah, I was able to stay up and, and, and answer those multiple choice questions. But that's not really the doctor that you want. We want to know that the individual really has met all of the expectations, all of the competencies for that person to be an independent practitioner. So um, now that we've spent almost the whole time talking about medical education, uh, for the closing minutes, let me talk a little bit about what's happening on the research arena. Uh, we could spend a whole day talking about that. As you know, recently, or just about a week ago, uh, eight days ago, we engaged in the research uh, strategic uh, uh, planning refresh uh, under the capable leadership of uh, the great Dr. Schulman. And I'm borrowing some of his slides to, show, to highlight some of the key points. So this is what we did on November 13. We were focusing on creating synergies for the future renaissance. Now, this was a classic slide. We talked about where we've been. We're talking about where we are and also where we need to go. Um, we are familiar with this one. This is really the strategic uh, vision for research that was uh, developed uh, two years ago under the leadership of uh, Dr. Abraham when he first arrived as the dean and chief academic officer. Um, and we wanted to see what progress had been made in these various pillars and also bridging platforms, and what other opportunities exist for us uh, to really make some mid-course adjustment and better position this great institution to benefit from whatever new uh, developments have taken place uh, in the scientific arena. Well, it was great. There was, um, we had 70 plus individuals uh, fully engaged. The discussions were quite robust and opportunities for synergies are quite exciting. And, and there's no question that uh, after the compilation of all of the, the great ideas that were presented, um, uh, uh, circulated, we're gonna have really a, a menu of great opportunities for us to begin to uh, differentiate the middle school uh, from others. Significant progress has been made in terms of infrastructure, which uh, Dr. Schulman outlined. Uh, even more exciting things are in the future as we are beginning uh, to, uh, as we are in the process of uh, finalizing uh, the architectural blueprint uh, for the new medical education slash um, biomedical research building, which will hopefully, uh, you know, we don't want to put a date to it, but uh, hopefully there'll be a hole soon uh, in the ground to make it happen. Uh, and, and if it doesn't happen, please join me. Uh, I have some hard hats and you know, we'll just make it happen ourselves. Uh, but no, this is a pretty exciting time. This is a very much um, in the future. The, the trustees of the university have fully embraced this and, and it's a very exciting um, proposition. Um, space, we have a completely new approach uh, to, out, to space allocation, and, and it is uh, clearly uh, established. Most of our researchers have had uh, an opportunity to weigh in on that, in that process, and we are now beginning to use the formula that has been created uh, to begin to properly uh, allocate uh, the very precious research space that we have. Uh, the number of proposals and, and, and funding from the NIH uh, continue to improve. Our NIH ranking, likewise, uh, is improving. 
and the number of publications uh, is uh, really spectacular. So just to give you a flavor for it, when you look at publications, uh, we see that uh, our investigators are publishing really in the top tier journals. Those are the number of publications in the top 10, top 25, and so forth that you see here, uh, which is uh, very exciting. It talks about uh, the vibrancy of the research program and also of the quality of the investigators that we have. And one important thing that we're trying to also do or accelerate uh, is to convert all of these fundamental discoveries into uh, intellectual property that can be commercialized because the only way to ultimately make all of that research relevant for our patients, which is really what we're all about, National Institutes of Health, um, it's, is to really commercialize it so it can ultimately get to the bedside. Um, so this is just a, um, a slide is showing some of these uh, important, uh, high, very prestigious journals in which our uh, people are, pr are producing, are, are, pr are publishing. Um, NIH ranking, number 40 uh, overall, uh, in terms of the Blue Ridge ranking with uh, human genetics and neurological surgery, uh, uh, surgery, dermatology, neurology, and ENT, all ranked among uh, the very, very best, which is a, a proud accomplishment. Human genetics, I'll note, is number four, and uh, neurology, and neuroscience, and I believe is uh, number nine, to be precise. Um, this is where we are. So this is the total funding that we had, 133.8 million, which is the largest in the state of Florida from the NIH. And this is where we're projecting, based on our calculations, uh, that we're going, where we're going to end up uh, for this year. And uh, we should um, end salary down to number 39. And, and if after discussing with the provost, uh, I believe that we may actually be able to move down some additional points if Dr. Schulman tells me that's right. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, so one of the things that we're going to invest in is uh, in the recruitment of a chair for medical informatics is actually quite fitting since we've had the Department of Medical Informatics, which has been um, essentially shelled, it's uh, in the library. Um, so it's certainly fitting that for the gross lecture, we should an announce the launch of the search for a chair of for medical informatics. Uh, why did we choose that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, according to the leaders of all the pillars, this is the one department that bridges everything. Not only the pillars, but also all the bridging platforms. So, so that's, a, that's a critical need that we need to um, uh, that we need to fulfill in conjunction with our partners on the main campus, uh, the Frost uh, Data Science Institute uh, that has been announced. Uh, we're also planning to invest in, uh, in some in more imaging. Uh, we're going to be purchasing something. Dr. Shulman promised me with all of the bundles that he received uh, in capital equipment uh, resources. Uh, again, very important. Uh, we recall the culture change um, exercise that we went through last fall, uh, where 62% of the faculty participated and articulated uh, for us all of the factors that impede faculty vitality and we have been working diligently to address them. Uh, as you recall, we've had the action teams that have been meeting, and they have uh, pretty much categorized these factors in four specific domains that we see here. And those teams have made prop have, have proposed some remedies to begin to uh, fix all of those concerns so that our faculty will be far more engaged, more productive, and will just be thrilled to jump out of bed and come to work. Because if that happens, then we know that uh, the, not only will the middle school thrive, the entire health system will thrive, and likewise, um, the patients will prefer to come here. We will become truly the preferred destination. So um, to summarize our plans for the coming year, we are committed to continuing to create a culture that empowers and inspires. Uh, we're going to be recruiting a chair for the Department of Medical Education who will undergird a lot of the curricular uh, innovative reforms that we are about to launch. Um, hopefully, once the faculty senate gives its blessing, we just don't want to presume that everything is going to be accepted, but that's, that's the process we're going to go through. 
that we will be recruiting the chair for medical informatics, as we talked about, uh, developing mentoring programs under the capable leadership of uh, our great uh, uh, dean of faculty affairs, Dr. Sintanj. And we are working diligently with um, the health system to address the uh, inequity, the salary inequity, especially when it comes to gender. Um, and, and I know we are poised to make something happen by the 30th of November, uh, which is very, very encouraging. It's not the end, but it is a significant commitment to getting to where we need to be. So there is complete alignment between the health system, medical school, to make sure that uh, we address those concerns that have been raised by the faculty. We need to secure the funding for the new medical education um, and research building. And we've created a new IDC fund flow um, that will not only allow us to accumulate some of the funds necessary to intentionally prioritize those uh, research areas that we think will be most productive um, for the Miller School, but also incentivize the PIs to continue to go out there and seek, uh, you know, and, and get funded by the NIH and other uh, extramural agencies. Uh, the, the plan is to keep 5% of the indirects uh, and give that to those PIs who are able to meet certain criteria, including uh, earning a sufficient amount of their um, supporting a sufficient amount of their salaries as stipulated. And last but not least, um, with the blessings of the faculty senate, we hope to be able to launch uh, the next gen MD curriculum. So, um, in the remaining few minutes, I just want to read a letter um, that uh, was written by a fictitious medical student um, that graduated uh, some 10 years ago. Um, and Sarah wrote to me asking about whether or not she, uh, well, whether she could come back um, to this great institution as a faculty, and because she's been doing good things and she's hearing certain things about the medical school. So I figured, let me try to respond. So, dear Sarah, thank you for writing to let me know of your interest in joining the Middle School of Medicine as an academic physician. Our educational and research programs have substantially changed, and it will be prudent of me to share with you how our medical school has evolved over the last 10 years since we graduated from the middle school in 2023 with your degree in medicine. You may remember that you were in the last graduating class of the legacy curriculum. While this curriculum gave you the requisite skills and knowledge needed to practice medicine, the curriculum was essentially the same as it had been since the school welcomed its first class of students back in 1952. Yet, as we know, the practice of medicine has great, had greatly evolved. The first two years of medical school were primarily spent in a lecture hall with you and your classmates trying to absorb hundreds of lecture slides to prepare for multiple choice exams. During your third year, you rotated through various clinical clerkships, trying to learn as much as possible to sharpen your clinical skills, only to regurgitate to regurgitate the information back, again through multiple choice exams, shelf exams, just so you could make sure you got a good grade. In your fourth year of medical school, well, you tell me how valuable you thought that really was. I'm sure you'll agree that, eh, maybe it could have been served in a different way. Your opportunities to conduct meaningful research were limited, and there were few, if any, opportunities to engage in innovation. Our healthcare system wasn't, wasn't designed to teach you about access, quality, and cost of healthcare. There was little, if any, emphasis on training you to work as a team member with different healthcare professionals to solve critical problems. We never explained to you why there was a 15-year lifespan difference between individuals who live in Brickell, in Brickell and those living in Overtown or what you should do to help to reduce these health disparities. But in defense of the Miller School, this type of four-year educational program was typical of most US medical schools at the time. Like many academic faculty around the nation, our faculty were burned out and unhappy. Our female faculty and basic science faculty were even more unhappy and dissatisfied with their roles in the medical school. 
It was clear to me that we needed to do something big to bring up my change at the Middle School of Medicine. So as you went off to complete your residency, we continued to bring about significant reform to our organization. This metamorphosis did not happen overnight, but little by little, year after year, we kept at it until we are now happy to say today that in the year 2033, things are different. And where exactly do you think we are? I'm so glad you asked. Our first initiative was to create a curriculum that trains students to become transformational leaders who, define, who will define the, uh, or shape the future of medicine, direct health systems, and impact healthcare globally. Through an integrated case-based approach to learning, students are now taught a more comprehensive and holistic understanding of health, one that captures the genetic, social, and environmental determinants of health. Our students no longer pay tuition. <laughs> Why not? This has helped the physician shortage, this has helped to alleviate the physician shortage that we are facing, especially in primary care. The health system is gonna pay. <laughs> students learn in an interdisciplinary team, in an interdisciplinary team setting, and have opportunities to collaborate, to collaborate asynchronously with their peers across the globe thanks to innovative technologies. I'm proud to say that the middle school has received numerous accolades from the AMA and the WMC for its groundbreaking curriculum, the Mashamba curriculum, <laughs> and the spending. The middle school of medicine now ranks number 12 in the US News and World Report annual rankings publication. The year you graduated, we were at number 48. Our NIH dollars have tripled <laughs> because we invested in our research infrastructure, we built that building, and placed a significant focus on trends and interdisciplinary research. We created robust partnerships with the schools of engineering, business, law, nursing, communication and marine and atmospheric sciences, to name a few, to conduct research and strengthen interprofessional education. For example, we work with Rasmus Marine and Atmospheric Sciences School uh, researchers to understand how extreme weather events like hurricanes affect a person's physical and mental health, but also affect water and food security, air quality and housing. Our students now work with patients to manage climate-induced health burdens, educate them about their risk factors, and help them develop contingency plans in case of environmental emergencies. This partnership, along with the location of the middle school in South Florida, helped us take the national lead in this effort. Over the last 10 years, our researchers have made significant strides to cure some untreatable, so until now, untreatable diseases. Our regenerative medicine team continues to lead the way in understanding how organs repair themselves and soon will make transplant, the transplantation of organs almost obsolete. I'm proud of the work we did around the faculty vitality and gender equity engagement. We now have an equal number of men and women working at the middle school and an equal representation of women in leadership positions. A recent survey of our faculty showed that 97% were energized by their work and felt the institution supported them in their effort. And though it took a few years, the salaries of men and women are now comparable. I'm happy to report we have a very engaged workforce. Sarah, I hope you can see how we are transforming the world through our education and research efforts. Please consider joining our team to continue writing this story of change and defining the future of the Middle School of Medicine. We would be honored to have you. Awesome. Esteemed colleagues and members of the Middle School family, I'm delighted to share some exciting news with you. The launch of the Middle School's new magazine, University of Miami Medicine 
Our new publication, which is also online, tells the stories of the groundbreaking discoveries taking place at the Miller School of Medicine. It also tells the stories of our innovations in medical education, our cutting-edge advances in clinical care, and the life-changing contributions being made through our community engagement programs. The butterfly on the cover represents the twin themes of rebirth and renewal, our renaissance. It is also a symbol of our transformative work with stem cells. The story inside details how the middle school, with its interdisciplinary stem cell institute, has become a powerhouse in regenerative medicine. Other stories focus on our pioneering advances in solving the mysteries of cancer, Alzheimer's disease, paralysis, and a host of other diseases and conditions. You'll also find stories on how philanthropy is driving innovation at the Miller School. You will find valuable insights from our alumni, faculty, students, and residents regarding their achievements and the important issues in medicine. These stories demonstrate why the Miller School is a unique mix of ambition, energy, and diversity, and is poised to become one of the nation's preeminent medical schools. I'm proud of our first issue, and I know you will be too. I hope that when you receive it, you will share it with your friends and family and display it proudly. Thank you so much. So, that fictitious letter is really not that far-fetched based on where we are right now. And I firmly believe that uh, with the continued contributions, dedication, and commitment of this amazing faculty and the great medical students that we have, the graduate students, the residents, fellows, and everybody else who makes this middle school family, we're gonna get there. So please support the Renaissance. Let's join in together. Thank you. I'll be happy to take some questions if that's permitted. Uh, we, are we allowed to let faculty council members speak up? No. <laughs> Adrian, please. Thank you for this outstanding uh, lecture, uh, Dean Ford. Um, it was very exciting to see uh, the vision that you have for the future of our medical school is very exciting. Yesterday, uh, I was doing the interview uh, for the residents in our department, ENT department, and uh, I had the opportunity to interview two medical students of our university. And they were very excited. They are very excited uh, to see that this new curriculum is changing and excited with new energy that you are bringing to the school. Um, I have a question about um, change. Change is always difficult, and we are going to a new culture, culture change. Uh, and uh, any culture change have challenges, and uh, the ethics that is, should be behind of everybody who's doing this change is fundamental for the success of where we are going all together, both in the medical education, for future physician that we're gonna have, and also for healthcare provider in the U-Health system. And I know that you both, uh, you and uh, Dr. Abraham, our CEO of U-Health, are very sensitive about this type of change. And I would love to ask you how you envision education in medi medical ethics so we have a future physician who do things not because they have to be compliant, but they do things because they want to do the best in their power. Do you have a plan for that? Because this is a fundamental for the success of our system. Thank you for the question, Adrian. And, and you've really touched on a key element. Uh, I firmly believe that ethics has to be part of the DNA of our training. It has to be part, it, it has to be the underpinning of the new curriculum. And our students have to have a strong foundation uh, in ethics. And, and working directly with Dr. Goodman and, and his team, we are going to make sure that uh, this is fully incorporated. But, but you know, the, it's, the, the concept is not to take an ethics class. 
the, the concept to me is that ethics has to be uh, woven in, in the discussions that take place during M&M, uh, you know, morbidity and mortality. When we consider the tough cases, that has to be part of our culture. It's only when it becomes part of the DNA of this institution that every single one of our students will be fully equipped to carry out their duty and be the types of transformational leaders that we are aiming to produce. So that's why I say the ethics has to be part of the core underpinnings of the new curriculum in everything that we teach, especially in the, fun, in the essentials of medical practice, when we start stressing all of these other the seven components that we talked about. And, and Drs. Machaba, Gardner, Deshpande, and everyone else has been involved in, 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 in framing this new curriculum. Uh, for, I've certainly considered that, and, they, and, and I have re-emphasized its importance. Thank you. Please. I don't think it's too early to start planning for how you're going to evaluate the success of this program yeah. for the people after their maybe 10 or 15 years gone from here. Because I think that most of, of the fruit that will be born is not going to necessarily be recognizable That's right. initially. And I think that, um, that, that you need to think about what it is you want to accomplish in the future. Because that's really what you're talking about is the different kind of person somewhere down the road. Thank you. Another excellent point. And, and as I have sat with the planning team, one of the things that we tried to do, and just didn't have enough time to show you all of this, we have developed both short-term, mid-term, and long-term metrics that would define success. Uh, even for year one, uh, you know, mid-years and, and as well. Uh, so of course, long-term, we aim to produce transformational leaders. We're going to be running, we're going to be running things. Uh, but, but before we get there, uh, we can actually measure success by, say, the number of our students uh, who are now engaging in you know, different forms of research. Uh, how many, you, know, you can say, how many publications they're generating if they are deciding to actually uh, pursue a scholarly project. You know, what's leading to different, uh, what's, you know, what's a measure of academic productivity or success? Uh, how many people are now really getting dual degrees? Whereas initially it was mostly MD, MD, MPH. Now, you know, we should be able to see a number of different uh, other uh, types of uh, uh, degrees being generated. How many of our students are actually transitioning early on uh, to, you know, to the accelerated pathway? So we have built in a number of metrics to examine the success or effectiveness of this curriculum, both during the first year as well as after the first year, but also um, after um, you know what would define short term, mid term, long term. That was one of the biggest challenges that I posed to Dr. Machaber, and, and, and he's responded mightily. Um, okay. Dr. Kofi. Thank you for a very inspiring talk. It makes me feel like I want to go back to medical school, actually. <laughs> Do I it know, again. I don't think you'd be able to get in. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> uh, the question is, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. It's very exciting. And I like the idea of the scholarly project that a student could follow all the way through. What efforts will there be to match students up with mentors and to keep that relationship going throughout medical school, particularly if the interests change over time. Dr. Machamber, I think we have found our volunteer to handle the scholarly project uh, management. <laughs> no, that, you, you raise a very important um, you know, um, topic, and, and that's one of the things that we're going to have to work on. We need to take an inventory of all of the um, PIs that we have, uh, what they're working on, and, and hopefully with our new robust uh, faculty Affairs Office and the implementation of the uh, new, um, what's the name of the software? Um, the digital measures. We're going to be able to track what everybody's doing and potentially have a blurb. And, you know, I don't think ORA can really help us with that, but we will have that information out of the dean's office that will allow 
our curriculum deans to help match uh, or at least inform the students as to who could be a potential um, you know, PI. And, and the other thing we're going to be doing is to make sure we reach out to all of those PIs uh, and invite them to serve as faculty mentors. Um, and, and we are working a different, we're going to be looking at different uh, ways to also incentivize the PIs and to welcome our students into their uh, research program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On that side, yeah, please. Uh, uh, Dean, uh, so this works. This microphone. Yeah, the microphones are the little buttons, black buttons in front yeah, of we, us. We're in a fancy place, folks. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the people in the back have to stand up because the microphones are up there. <laughs> so, uh, so just to, you know, as we use the microphone, she handed you because you're covering your mouth and it's hard for us to hear. All right, just use them. Give him the mic. All right, all right, I'll use the microphone. Uh, so, so he was trying to show us that he has a very really state of the art should facility. I, should I stand too? Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, so this is exciting, as we've all said, uh, and, uh, and I agree that, you know, the clinician scientist continues to be kind of the model that we strive for in a medical student education, especially when we compare it to the rest of the healthcare team that the medical student interacts with, which is a very important part of what the medical student education is going to be. So my question is, as we continue to evolve and, uh, and we create these partnerships in the healthcare community, we have an incredible partner right down the street, which is Miami-Dade College, mm -hmm. which is training incredible professionals that are part of the healthcare team. Are we gonna try to integrate our medical students into their curriculum and integrate them into our medical school, school curriculum? Uh, and as part of that, can we aspire to make healthcare equity a premium part of our goal and perhaps make 33136 the healthiest zip code in Florida? It truly eloquently stated, and, and, and certainly we embrace that concept. Look, you know, part of our mission as a university and certainly as a medical school uh, is to be relevant, right? And we, it's not enough to be excellent, it's not enough to be great um, if that excellence is not accessible to everybody in our community. We have not done such a great job, um, and, and we recognize that. And this is something that we continue to, to discuss. I mean, when we talked about the, uh, the social determinants of health and, and the fact that there is a 15 year uh, difference between life expectancy in Overtown and in, in, in Brickle, which are 2.8 miles uh, apart. Uh, in, in, and we've been in existence since 1952, we, we have dropped the ball. But, but clearly, we are more cognizant of it. We have a number of. Uh, motivated faculty members uh, who want to address that and it's uh, important for the leadership to, to figure out in, in a constructive and meaningful way how we're going to be relevant, how we're going to come up with the steps of innovating programs. I don't have an answer for you right now, but I can tell you that this, very much, this is very much one of the areas that we need to uh, think to, through clearly and uh, the, our cabinet will going to be talking about that. Patty. Dean Ford, thank you so much. That was so inspiring. And I want to thank you for your vision of the future, because I feel like it's a vision of the future, but we're just barely catching up of what's going on. Um, I saw that you had on one of your slides as leadership and advocacy is a point of focus. And uh, we have too many leaders in medicine today that are not ethical physicians. And you can see where it's gotten us with the opioid crisis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, how. what is your vision of this leadership and advocacy um, sure. you know curriculum and, right. and what is what would be the outcome of that in your in your mind well you know so I, I go back to Rudolf Virchow uh, the noted German uh, 
um, pathologists, anthropologists, uh, who argues that the physician, the physician is the attorneys for the poor, and their problems need to be addressed. Uh, their, their medical problems need to be addressed also by the physician because you know it's where you live it has a lot to do with, with, your, with your healthcare. Um, we certainly want, in addition to imparting the, the basic sciences, the, the, the fundamentals to our students, they need to be conscious of this particular aspect. And, and when I envision interprofessional education, I mean, I, I see, if, you know, unless overtime undergoes a rapid gentrification process, but wouldn't it be great if we had a facility where our students could actually go, our physicians could actually be monitoring them, nursing students could come, social work students could come, some of our law students, so they can begin to address some of the problems that lead to the disparities that we encounter, that, that those people that we're serving are encountering. I think this is a component of the advocacy. We know that advocacy is already part of the um, uh, portfolio of uh, many of our students. Uh, so, so many of them can be found in Tallahassee instead of being in the class, instead of <laughs> in the classroom. Uh, and we may have to send them some nasty grams that you are in med school and you're not here to become a politician. Uh, but but it, it really speaks to their lo level of, uh, of social consciousness. And, and, and Dr. Tooks has been a, a big role model. I guess he escaped. He's been a, a, a big role model uh, for them when it comes to advocacy. Of course, your work is uh, well documented. And uh, where Dr. Schechter has been another one of these uh, strong advocates. And, and so, so there are many examples, but, but we need to really socialize that approach in our curriculum so that it's going to be part of the fabric of what we do, just like uh, uh, we heard about ethics. So is it time for reception? No, OK. <laughs> we, got, we have more. There, there are two more questions, and then we can present. Okay. Uh, well, also, thank you very much for the lecture. I really enjoy it. And knowing that the Miller School of Medicine is a powerful, not just school, but it's also impacting the health of people in Miami, and the vision you have to impact it more in terms of equity. And then, but it's not just Miami, I mean, because it's the state of Florida and it's also the nation. And also more and more from Latin America and the, Latin America and the Caribbean, they see it as a destination for medical students. Mm -hmm. But not much at the global health level. Uh, do you see like in the future, like impacting or trying to get involved more into global health issues or not really not that far? Uh, I don't know. It's okay, it's just global a question. Health? Yeah, global, global health. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I think, uh, well, we know what our president has stated, um, that uh, we're going to be the hemispheric, the excellent, uh, um, the exemplary, and the relevant university. And, and, and so it really means that we have to focus on a number of those issues. Uh, we have an emerging um, think tank that's trying to explore the concept of establishing uh, an Institute for Sustainable Planetary Health. Uh, this would be which, where the president is actually a, a critical factor, but Felicia Knoll uh, is also playing a key role. But it would bring together uh, all of the key stakeholders from all of the various schools, um, you know, Erasmus, business, law, uh, medicine, um, arts and sciences, uh, in nursing to actually see what we can do um, that's, that others cannot do. We, we, I really believe we have an opportunity to create uh, such a program that would rival the one at Harvard uh, because of our strategic location. And if we do so, uh, we would be instantaneously a preferred destination for certainly everyone in Latin America and in the Caribbean. Uh, and, and many others uh, from, from you know, European uh, um, um, countries. So I, I, I like the concept, and uh, we have uh, been meeting. It's a little bit slow to evolve. Uh, but with our question, that's something that uh, is very important. 
and, and that has to be one of the defining it has to be one of the defining elements uh, for the middle school and the University of Miami in general. So, thank you for that question. Please, you, you got to stand up, otherwise Ellen is going to be unhappy. Uh, thank you again for the lecture, Dean Ford. Um, a few of us, especially in my class, I'm a current first year student. Um, how can we, uh, as current students, help push uh, your division and implementation of the current, uh, of the new curriculum, um, particularly as the new incoming classes are coming in in the next few years? How can we be able to help them with our current experience be able to ease into the new curriculum? Wow. Well, well, thank you. What, what a great question. I, I really appreciate uh, um, the endorsement and, and, and the willingness to do that. Uh, you know, we are working very closely with um, the student government leadership and keeping them um, apprised of where we are, where we're going. And, and there's going to be a critical role for you uh, to play and the, the current students in the legacy curriculum uh, to inform us as to what could be what we can do differently, what we can, what could be done better. One of the um, uh, scheduled exercises um, for next, um, for January is um, um, to take 20 students, current, second, third, third, third and fourth year, and then we're going to uh, try to teach for class. We have a uh, an expert coming uh, to help uh, teach for class to those students using the new uh, pedagogy. Uh, and it's going to be, we're going to have all of our, well, as many of our professors observing as possible so that they can learn uh, the approach to delivering this new curriculum. And, and I think there are going to be opportunities uh, uh, for you, for the first year class uh, to participate in other activities. But right now, I just don't know which ones yet. Uh, Doctors Machaba, Gardner, Deshpande, I'm sure will be coming up with uh, uh, other areas where we're going to need your full participation. Because at the end of the day, uh, it's it's really it, it, it's a family affair. We we all have to uh, get in together. And and from your perspective, it's seeing uh, some of the potential uh, that uh, this new approach offers, and, and making sure that somehow. Uh, even on the back end, you can still capitalize on it. Uh, we, let's say that one of the drivers uh, for change um, and for adopting this philosophy about uh, the new curriculum uh, came from a number of your know, classmates, uh, well, like this from previous years, who were somewhat jealous of what the MD and PA students were getting uh, because they were getting a little bit of a sampling of social determinants of health and, and understanding uh, uh, why people develop certain types of problems while others do not and so forth. And, and we were paying, we were not focusing on those on the regular MD curriculum. But now we're gonna have this uniform curriculum that really addresses just about all these elements. And uh, so you know, it, it's people like you saying, hey, we want to be part of this thing and we want to uh, help uh, you know, shape the future. Uh, that's really going to help us uh, hopefully come up with the ideal um, um, plan. And it's, a, it's an iterative process. Uh, trust me, we believe in continuous quality improvement. We're not going to get it right the first time always, but we're going to be committed to continuing to improve every single day. So thank you very much, and uh, let's have some food.